Welcome all, myself, Dr. Lakshmi Narayana, working as a consultant in critical care department, Apollo Hospital, Jubilees. I thank ICC Hyderabad chapter for giving me this opportunity. My topic of presentation is traumatic brain injury, case-based approach and evidence-based management. Coming to case scenario, 35-year-old man brought to emergency department with history of road traffic accident. On examination, his GCS was 7 by 15. Pupils were 4 mm in size, bilateral equal and fixed. Bleeding from left ear was observed. On examination, his heart rate was 120 per minute. Blood pressure was 110 by 18 millimeters mercury. After initial stabilization, secondary survey revealed multiple rib fractures on right side of chest. In any traumatic brain injury patient, pre-hospital care is very much important to prevent hypotension and hypoxia. Primary survey includes airway management with cervical spine immobilization, breathing and ventilation optimization, circulation and hemorrhage control, disability to look for any neurological deficits, exposure and environmental control, which is followed by active resuscitation. Adjuvance to primary survey includes bedside investigations like chest X-ray, ABG, bed glucose, etc. Once primary survey has been completed, we should proceed to secondary survey, which includes complete examination from head to toe to look for other injuries. The adjuvance to secondary survey includes CT scan and other investigations. Definitive care includes if the patient requires immediate surgical intervention. Patient has to be shifted to operation theater or if conservative management is planned, he can be shifted to ICU or room according to the patient condition. There are many severity scores to assess the severity of traumatic brain injury, like Glasgow Coma Scale, Four Score, Marshall CT Classification, and Rotterdam CT Score. Out of these, the most commonly used is Glasgow Coma Scale. According to ATLS guidelines, traumatic brain injury is classified based on severity of injury and according to morphology. With respect to severity of injury, if the GCS score is less than 8, it is classified as severe. With respect to morphology, it is classified further into skull fractures and intracranial lesions. Intracranial lesions include epidural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, and intracerebral hemorrhage. And diffuse patterns include axonal injury, etc. Any patient who is an anticoagulation and he meets with traumatic brain injury, he should be reversed uh, reverse as soon as possible in order to prevent further hematoma expansion. If INR is more, patients should be transfused with FFP, vitamin K in order to normalize the INR. Similarly, if there is thrombocytopenia, platelets have to be transfused. Traumatic brain injury, the complications are mainly due to primary injury and secondary injury. Primary injury is due to physical dam damage to the brain parenchyma. And secondary injury is due to cerebral edema, hematoma expansion, hydrocephalus due to vasospasm, calcium ion toxicity, and also due to seizures. So the cuts of treatment in traumatic brain injury patient is to prevent this secondary brain injury. The primary factors to be prevented are hypotension, hypoxia, hyperthermia, hyper or hypoglycemia, and increased intracranial pressure. According to Brain Trauma Foundation, the recent guidelines which was published in 2016 with respect to various treatment modalities used in traumatic brain injury patients like ventilation lift therapies, steroid usage, either prophylaxis, control of intracranial pressure has been discussed in further slides. Coming to hyperosmolar therapy, in order to control the intracranial pressure, it includes hypertonic saline and mannitol. 
Mannitol should be avoided in patients with systolic blood pressure less than 90. According to the guidelines, mannitol to be used in the dosage of 0.25 to 1 gram per kg body weight, and it should be avoided in patients with hypotension. Restrict mannitol use prior to ICP monitoring if there are signs of transtentorial herniation. Cerebrospinal fluid drainage. If the patient has extraventricular drainage, the recommendation says that continuous drainage is preferred over intermittent drainage. Use of CSF drainage to lower ICP in patients with an initial GCS less than 6 during the first 12 hours after injury may be considered. It is level 3 recommendation. If the patient is not responding to medical management, then surgical management can be used as a last resort, like which, is, which includes decompressive craniectomy. It helps in decreasing the cerebral edema due to primary injury as well as secondary injury. Level 2A recommendation states that bifrontal decompressive craniectomy is not recommended to improve outcomes in severe traumatic brain injury patients. A large frontotemporal parietal decompressive craniectomy is recommended over a small one. There are two famous trials with respect to it, like DECRA trial and rescue ICP trial. Both these trials have proven worst disability outcome with respect to decompressive craniectomy. Whereas rescue ICP trial have showed some mortality benefit. Surgical management of a traumatic brain injury patients, either it could be epidural hematoma or subdural hematoma or intracranial hemorrhage, depends upon the volume of blood deterioration of neurological status and midline shift. Ventilatory therapies. Any patient whose GCS is less than eight should be intubated in order to acquire a definite airway. And the target PCO2 should be 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. Guidelines say that hyperventilation is recommended as a temporizing measure for the reduction of elevated intracranial pressure. Hyperventilation should be avoided during the first 24 hours after injury. Level 2B recommendation clearly states that prolonged prophylactic hyperventilation with PSCO2 of 25 millimeters mercury or less is not recommended. With respect to analgesia and sedatives used in traumatic brain injury, Level 2B recommendation states that High dose barbiturate administration is recommended to control elevated ICP refractory to standard therapies. Propofol can be used, but the mortality benefit has not been seen. In fact, high dose propofol can produce significant morbidity. With respect to steroid usage, high quality evidence clearly states that steroids should not be used in traumatic brain injury patients to reduce ICP. In fact, high dose methylprednisolone was associated with increased mortality and is definitely contraindicated. Level 2B recommendation states that hypothermia is not recommended in traumatic brain injury patients. Euthermia should be followed. There are two famous trials with respect to temperature management, that is Eurotherm trial and polar ICU trial. Both these trials states that Hypothermia is not recommended in traumatic brain injury patients. Nutrition. When nutrition should be started in a traumatic brain injury patient? Recommendation states that at least by fifth day or at most by seventh day post-injury, nutrition should be started to decrease mortality. And when we start nutrition, transgastric or transjejunal feeding is preferred. Deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis recommendation. Any traumatic brain injury patients, deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis should be started as early as possible if there is no contraindication through medications or by mechanical prophylaxis. Medications include low molecular weight apparent or low dose unfractionated apparent. Coming to most important aspect, when to start a scissor prophylaxis in a traumatic brain injury patient. Level 2 recommendation states that 
prophylactic usage of phenytoin or valproate is not recommended to prevent late post traumatic seizures phenytoin is recommended to decrease the incidence of early post traumatic seizures that is within 7 days of injury coming to the thresholds that is what bp threshold to be maintained in traumatic brain injury patients and other thresholds like intracranial pressure cerebral perfusion pressure according to brain trauma foundation blood pressure thresholds include in patients with age group of 50 to 69 systolic bp should be maintained greater than 100 mm mercury in age group of 15 to 49 years and in 70 years systolic blood pressure to be maintained greater than 110 mm mercury to decrease mortality and improve outcomes similarly in intracranial pressure monitoring should be done to reduce in hospital and two week post injury mortality in this set of patient we should go for intracranial monitoring patients with severe traumatic brain injury gcs of less than 8 and with an abnormal ct scan in severe traumatic brain injury if the ct scan is normal any of the two following criteria present patient should be monitored for intracranial pressure that is age greater than 40 years unilateral or bilateral posture monitoring or systolic bp less than 90 mm mercury intracranial pressure monitoring can be done by intraventricular drain subdural bolt intracranial current camel catheter or epidural catheter the recommendation states that icp should not be allowed to raise greater than 22 mm mercury because it is associated with increased mortality with respect to cerebral perfusion pressure thresholds cpp should be maintained in the range of 60 to 70 mm mercury avoiding aggressive attempts to maintain cpp greater than 70 mm mercury to be done because it is associated with risk of adult respiratory failure so how to prognosticate a traumatic brain injury patient there are many prognosticating models but the most commonly used ones are impact prognostic model and crass prognostic model these two models include factors like age of the patient motor score whether the patient is hypotensive at the time of injury hypoxia ct scan findings nuclear reactions based on these factors we can predict the in hospital mortality the post in day mortality and long term neurological outcome of the patient so concluding my talk in any traumatic brain injury one should prevent hypoxia and hypotension that is very much important to prevent secondary brain injury use normal saline to maintain euvolemia avoid hypotonic or hypotonic solutions surgery should be decided based on the amount of blood volume the mass effect due to injury and the deterioration of the neurological status always monitor intracranial pressure whenever indicated avoid increase intracranial pressure greater than 20 mm mercury maintain cerebral perfusion pressure greater than 70 and less than greater than 60 and less than 70 adequate sedation and analgesia to be provided short term use of anti epileptic drugs are encouraged only to prevent early post traumatic seizures always maintain blood glucose in the range of 140 to 180 mm mercury maintain normal thermia provide duty prophylaxis whenever indicated and level 1 clear uh, level 1 indication clearly states that there is no role for steroids in traumatic brain injury patients so always follow and promote road safety rules thank you for a patient listening